Jeremiah chapter 10. This is kind of a reminder. This isn't new stuff that you're not familiar with. But this is something that I think we need to be reminded of often. And that is that being made by God in his image, that is, we're to be his imagers, that can never happen. It demands that you have to have a personal relationship with him in order to really image him. It means that if you are a believer and have a personal relationship with the Lord, it means that you must go deeper, that you must come to know the Lord on a deeper, more personal level, so that then he can use that to transform your life into a channel through which he can come into your world. And when God comes into your world, then he can impact your world. And all of that can happen only because of the cross. Because as you know, and we're all guilty of this, all humanity has turned away from God. And through the cross, and only through the cross, God has provided an opportunity for human beings to turn back to him. And I believe that those of you that are here tonight are part of those that have done just that. You've turned back to him. It's a wonderful thing when you stop to think of the fact that God's not a dictator that demands our obedience but he gives his creatures the freedom, if they choose to, to reject him. Isn't that amazing? He still gives us also a chance that if we choose to reject him, we can return to him. And that's the blessing. We can return to him, and not only that, we can return and we can build a deeper and more devoted relationship with him than we ever had before. That's the kind of God that I worship. That's the kind of God that you worship. And every believer really wants to know the answer to two questions. And I think that Jeremiah 10 answers both of them. And the first question I'll share with you in a moment after we pause and pray. And Father, we're thankful that we can bow before you once again tonight because as uh, Peter said to Jesus, when Jesus asked him, will you also go away? He said, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. Lord, there's no one else that we can turn to and get what we need for this life, but you. And so, Lord, we turn to you tonight, and we're thankful that you've made a way for us to do that. And oh, Lord, we come to embrace you as we've sung tonight. Lord, we've come to understand in a fresh and new way just how important our personal connection with you really is. So I thank you for this, the prophet Jeremiah's words. I pray that it would have real weight with us tonight and that you'd use it, Spirit of God, because you wrote it. You authored it. So use it. And as Jeremiah himself said, write it in our hearts by the Spirit of the living God, in Jesus' name, amen. One of the first questions I think that Jeremiah answers for us is, what is God's will? Every serious believer 
wants to know the answer to that question. What is God's will? To put it even more basic than that, what was I made for? I know that God has a specific plan for me to follow that will take me forward to complete the whole of my life here on this earth. I know that God wants me to be a particular kind of person, and he wants me to connect that with a certain lifestyle that he wants me to live. And I, I need to know what God intends for me so that I can cooperate with him and thus fulfill his plan for me and through me. So the first question is, what is God's will? I'm not going to answer that from this text yet, but we'll get to it. Because that's not how Jeremiah starts this chapter, 10. He starts with the second question that every believer wants to know. Not only what is God's will, but what is God like? What is God really like? You got Jeremiah 10. <laughs> You'll note how he begins in verse uh, 3. He's talking about the heathen, and he says, The customs of the people are vain. One cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but they speak not. They must needs be born because they can't go. Don't be afraid of them. They can't do evil, neither also is it, is it in them to do good. Jeremiah begins to answer the question, what is God like? You want to know what God's like? Well, he's not like these idols. And so Jeremiah begins condemning idolatry. In fact, when you read this chapter, you come to the conclusion that the prophet cannot simply conceive of someone that doesn't believe in spiritual realities. Even if they don't believe in the God of Israel, they believe in the spirit realm. If you don't know the true God, Jeremiah seems to say here that uh, you'll make a God to take his place. That human nature is just innately religious. Jeremiah knows this. And basically he says, if you're a human being, you must have a God. You need to worship something. You long to know someone who is able to transcend your problems, even if it's a delusion. So what do you do? Well, in the first five verses of Jeremiah 10, he talks about how the heathen deal with that innate need in their heart. They come up with false gods. And I've already read verses three to five. Then basically what he says in those verses is, here's what they do. If they don't have the true God, they go out in the woods, they cut down a tree, and they carve a God from that tree, a, a God that... Uh, is, supposed, is supposedly to hold value, so they plate that, that tree that they cut with their own hands with gold, and they don't realize that they are the ones that are attributing value to their gods. And then they make this assumption that their god's reliable and will bring stability to their lives, and so they nail their idol to a platform to keep it from tipping over. And, uh, and since God's supposed to be easily accessible, verse 5, they put it on wheels so it can move to make itself, uh, so they can make it available to those that would worship it. That's false gods. But the true God, he begins to speak about Every believer wants to really know what God is like. Well, he begins to unfold what God is like in the sixth verse. 
and, and down uh, to uh, verse 22. He begins by saying in verse 6, There is none like unto thee. O Lord, thou art great. Thy name is great in might. In fact, when Jeremiah says what he does in the first five verses about false gods, he's actually ridiculing them. He's making fun of these false gods. But look at what he says about the true God. He says the true God is incomparable. Jeremiah makes fun of the idols who, uh, or the idolaters, I should say, who turn away from the peerless one, the, the, the God who has no peers, to gods that they themselves made. In verses 8 and 9, he, he's, he's making fun of their false gods. He says they're altogether brutish. That is, they're dumb. They have no intelligence. They're foolish. Their stock is a doctrine of vanities. That is, they're without intellectual capacity. And they're simply inanimate. But look at the God, the true God of Israel. I already read verse 6. Look at verse 7. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? O Lord, thou art great. He says, all the kingdoms in all the, the, the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there's none like unto thee. Verse 7. Look at verse 10. The Lord is the true God. He is the living God, an everlasting king. In verse 12, he made the earth by his power. He established the world by his wisdom, stretched out the heavens by his discretion. Here's the true God. He's incomparable. He is unique. He is the creator. He is the source of all. He is the sustainer of all. He made all that exists, and he provides all of our necessities, and he is the ruler of human history. Look at it. <clears throat> it says in, uh, drop down to verse 17 and 18. Here, the Lord of hosts, the true God, the living God, the incomparable one, he's not only unique, He's not only a God that there is no other God like because he's the only one that exists. He's the true God. Other ones are false. He's the living God. The other ones have no life at all. But he is also sovereign. The true God is not only incomparable because he's unique. He's incomparable because he is sovereign. In fact, in verses 17 and 18, it's, it's almost humorous. He's speaking to the inhabitants of Jerusalem here. And he, he's about to send them into exile in Babylonian captivity. And so what he says in verse 17 is basically, pack your bags, you're going. You're going on a long trip. Gather up your wares out of the land, O inhabitants of the fortress, Jerusalem. 18. For thus saith the Lord, behold, I, I'm going to sling you out. I'm going to sling out the inhabitants. I'm going to fling you out of the land and will distress them. He's the sovereign of human history. He's telling the Jews of Jerusalem, pack your bags because in anger, he's going to fling them out of the land and he is going to pour great distress upon them. The Babylonian captivity. That's what. 17 and 18 are talking about. But the true God is not only incomparable, and this is really the bulk and, and emphasis that I want to make tonight about the true God. He's not only incomparable, but he is essential because of that, because he's unique, because he's sovereign. He is essential in your life, in our lives. And the ancient people, they knew that they were made to worship someone beyond themselves. 
the ancients knew that they were made for another, someone that transcended themselves, someone bigger than themselves. You know, honestly, when you study ancient cultures, you get the clear impression that atheism, as we know today, is a modern phenomenon. There weren't atheists back then. They didn't all worship the true God, but they knew that there was a spirit being that was to be worshipped. They believed in the spiritual. It might have been occult. It might have been superstition. But they weren't atheists. That's for sure. In fact, when you read the scripture, even the demons aren't atheists. The demons believe in God and they tremble. So human beings in this modern world that we live in have gone far beyond even the de demonic realm in this proclaimed atheism, which I don't believe in. Atheists don't believe in God. I don't believe in atheists. I don't think they're being honest. I don't think they're, they really exist. I don't believe in the existence of, of true atheists. I think if you if you peel the layers back, you'll find that they have some superstition. They have some uh, spiritual uh, thing that they cling to. It may not be God. Reminds me of a story, a true story that I read <clears throat> of uh, a couple of preachers when the when the Berlin Wall came down in eighty nine. And uh, the Soviet Union began to open up to the gospel. A couple of preachers, they, uh, they went to uh, Moldova. And uh, while they were there, they met with different governmental officials. And one of the Moldavian officials was the minister of culture and cults. The minister of culture and cults. And the, the preacher that was telling the story said, this man was intimidating. He was 6'4". He was an intellectual. And uh, he didn't look happy. And he looked like he really wanted to, you know, butt heads with them. And somewhere in the conversation as he was showing them around he stopped and he said to one of the preachers there he said you know i'm the minister of culture he didn't say cults i'm the minister of culture and you and i both know the way that people normally express culture is through religion our government, he said, has taken our culture away from us. And the result is, and I'm, I'm quoting this, the result is that we as a people are staring into the very face of the devil himself and we've come away with our flesh seared. Can you help us? Unquote. Here's a man that spent his whole life living in communistic atheism. And yet, at the moment when he was honest, he revealed that his heart was yearning for something beyond himself. And that is at the very center of human existence. I say, the what is God like? He's incomparable, but he is also essential for human life. Drop down with me, and this is where I want to end our time here, verse 23. This answers the question. Every believer wants to know not only what God is like, but what is God's will? Verse 23, O oh Lord. Now this is a verse you might want to memorize. It's tremendous. O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. 
There are two times in that verse where the word man appears, but in the Hebrew language that the Bible was written in, it's two different Hebrew words. The first time, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. The word man there is the word that we get the word Adam from. It's Adam. And it's a reference to the whole human race. And then he says in that 23rd verse, it is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. The second time the word man appears, it's the Hebrew word ish, which doesn't refer to the whole human race, but it denotes a significant, specific person or individual. So the race and people, individuals like you and me, are who is being addressed here. This is how God is essential to us. The way of man is not in himself. It's not in man that walketh to direct his steps. See the word walketh there? The word walketh is descriptive of being goal-oriented. You see, because we are God imagers, because God made us in his image and likeness, we are people that have to have purpose and goals in life in order to exist. All human beings want to get somewhere. But what Jeremiah says, while all humans are goal-oriented, they want to get somewhere, they're ignorant about how to get there. There has to be a way for us to live, he says, but we can't find our way on our own. Have you ever been truly lost? I mean, I'm not talking about a car. I used to do a bit of hunting when I pastured in Connecticut because it was more rural. And one time I was small game hunting. And I would always go after, you know, I had all my work done. So it would be late in the afternoon. <clears throat> and I went into the woods. And I had been in that area, but I didn't know the woods very well. And I went in the woods and I got lost. And I mean, I got lost. I could not find my way out. And panic began to grip my heart because I saw the sun was lowering. And it was going to be dark, and I was going to get I, I was going to spend the night in those woods if I did. I wasn't prepared for that. I remember crying out to the Lord and asking him to help me find my way. And somehow I stumbled out of the woods and found my way before the sun set. But that, that was a scary experience, really. It was. Because there was no one else around. I was alone by myself. It's not in man that walketh to direct his steps. We need a guide. Again, I grew up most of my life in the country. My wife grew up on a dairy farm. If you know anything about farming, they plow the fields. They plow the fields, but you know how you plow the field? When, you, when you're pulling that plow on the tractor, you're looking at an object, a fixed object on the, at the other end of that field, and you're, you're heading for it because if you don't, you're, the, the, the plow furrows are crooked. So you want to find like a tree, and you head directly to that to keep straight furrows when you plow a field. I mean... If you're plowing a field, you don't want to fix your eyes on a cow. Because when that cow moves, then you're, you know, you, you get a, a, a real crooked uh, furrow in the ground. Point is this. Human beings do not have a built-in compass. Without an external point of reference in our lives, we go around in circles. God is essential to the human life. He says, it is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. 
This is why human beings are innately religious and long for someone beyond themselves because they're not self-sufficient. We are not self-sufficient people. If we turn inward, Jeremiah says, we're going to lose our direction and we're going to end up in delusion, in deceiving ourselves. It's necessary that, uh, that uh, we have an unmovable point of reference that is beyond ourselves. God made us to need him. And if not, you'd live your life on your own. And when people live their life on their own, they destroy themselves no matter what it might look like. Your dependence on God is simply because you're his imager. You're made in his image. And so that's why you depend upon him. Have you thought about this fact? Human beings are totally insufficient in themselves. For instance, human beings are not self-originating. I had no say in uh, as to whether I would come into this world or not. Neither did you. It was it was the decision of our mothers and our fathers. And in fact, I didn't originate myself. I was in the womb for nine months before I emerged. I'm not self originating, and neither is any other human being. Neither. Am I or you self-sustaining? We have to eat several times a day. We have to drink water more than that. We have to have uh, uh, rest. We have to have certain things. Or if we don't breathe 18 times, you know, every minute, if we don't have sufficient ox oxygen supply, we're dead. We're not self-sustaining or self-originating. We're not even self-explanatory. I mean, you can't explain a man unless you have a, 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 a female. You can't explain a female unless you have a man. We're not on our, in, in ourselves self-explanatory. And we're not self-fulfilling either. So many people have the idea, if I can only do what I want, my life will just be fulfilled. And what they find out is when they have what they want, it doesn't fulfill their life. Because we're not made like that. That's not the way we're made. We're not self-fulfilling people. Every human being is incomplete without God. It's like Augustine said, and I don't care for much of what that man said, but I like this. He said, you have been made not for yourself. God made us for himself, and we will never find rest until we rest in him. That's it. And what I want you to do about this is I want you to seek the Lord. And I want you to seriously seek him like you never have before. Now that you know how essential it is, what God is like and what God wills for you, that he is the incomparable one and he is essential, I want you to seek him in his word. I want you to seek him in your daily life in a, in a focused way like you never have before. I want you to seek him and not come up for air, so to speak, until you connect with him. I'll guarantee it. It'll be the most fulfilling experience up to this point in your life. I want you to seek God because it's not in you to direct your steps. I might be speaking to people here that are, are very uh, just discouraged with life. Maybe your problems have overwhelmed you. Maybe you have, uh, a, a, uh, have thoughts of giving up. What's the use? Can't win. Here's your answer. God's essential in your life. 
When was the last time you really sensed God's presence in time alone with him? I suggest, you remember the old, the old saying, stop the world, I want to get off? Well, you know what? Stop and get alone with God. No matter what that might take or what that might look like. Maybe it means that you go away uh, to some cabin in the woods without your phone. With your Bible. And seek God. And a, maybe a Christian book that God has, in, has used in your heart and life and past. Seek God. And then find out. Find out in your connection with him, what's the next step for you? And see what God will show you and how he'll use you. You need this kind of refreshing because it's essential to human life because you're made in God's image. If all you're doing is sitting on the couch or sitting in your recliner and watching your your, your favorite television shows or reading your favorite uh, uh articles or surfing the internet for this, that, and the other, and, and scrolling all the time and looking at this, that's a distraction. Even if it's, even if it's Christian stuff, it's a distraction. God wants you one-on-one -on -one with him. Don't settle for anything less than that. God wants to meet you. It's essential that you do meet with him.